Good afternoon, everybody. Today is June something. What is it? June 16, 2022. And today's topic is high conflict custody litigation. Um, so this topic really with the high conflict aspect could be over three sessions, but we're going to cram what we can into one hour and we may not get to get, get to everything. But I have um, three guests today. One of them's missing in action, but we're hoping that she's just having a little technical difficulty and will be able to join us in a few moments. We have Lee Spresser, who is a partner at McGinnis. I don't know if I'm saying it right, Chapelli and Spresser. So Chapelli, yeah, McGinnis, Chapelli, and Spresser and Troy. And we also have Ryan Kelly, who's a partner at Kelly and Kelly in Northville. And then uh, hopefully we'll soon see Siri Gottlieb join us. And you know what? Since she's not here right now, I'm going to wait to introduce her. Um, so she can add anything to that she wants to say. And of course, I think everybody here knows um, Lise and Ryan, a very active full-time family law um, practitioners in Oakland County. And, and I, I think a lot of you folks already know who they are. So we'll, with that, we're going to get started um, with the uh, topic of high conflict custody litigation. So, you know, with thinking about this topic, I kind of felt that we have to treat high conflict cases differently. And, and yes, I know I do appeals and it's even, I can't even imagine, they're hard for me, um, but I can't imagine how difficult it is to be a trial attorney in the high conflict cases. And, and, and just a couple of preliminary remarks I wanted to share, and then I have some questions for Ryan and Lise. Um, I know if it's a high conflict case, I know it's gonna be a lot more work and there's gonna be a lot, well, I think, I think one of you ladies mentioned this, a lot more prep time. So let's just for a second, do you want to have any comments about the kind of prep time that goes into a high conflict custody case? Ryan, do you want me to go or do you want to? Yeah. <laughs> um, so, so I think when we're talking about high conflict cases, there's, there's really two possible stages. There's um, I, either, it's either in the midst of a divorce case or post judgment. Um, and we're really talking about things like motion practice or constant correspondences back and forth with the opposing attorney or mediation or other ways of addressing the issues that are arising um, throughout the case. Or the second piece is if we're truly preparing for some type of litigation, an evidentiary hearing or a divorce trial. Um, so when we're talking about preparations, um, if it's not already in the midst of, of potential trial or evidentiary hearing type litigation, I think the prep really is working with your client to make sure they're doing the right things all the time. Um, I, I think the homework is you don't want your client creating problems for you um, and finding themselves sort of not, not in the court's favor. So when there's not you know, pending um, hearings, I think the prep work really is just working with your client to make sure they're constantly taking the high road, constantly doing the right thing, constantly protecting themselves when they're sending communications or having discussions with the opposing party. Um, I think when we start talking about prepping for litigation, it's something entirely different. That takes an incredible amount of time. Um, when I uh, you know, I'm preparing my clients. I've got a number of golden rules that I, you know, I'm sure we'll talk about today in terms of getting ready to testify, um, gathering information and documentation and evidence. Um, but there certainly is a ton of work that goes into preparing for um, properly high conflict cases. Uh, I'll take a pause for a minute before I get to my next question because I want to make sure we welcomed Siri Gottlieb. And I didn't introduce you earlier, Siri, because I wanted to make sure you were in the room so you could add anything you wanted to. But I was going to um, share, I think a lot of people like Ryan and Lise already know Siri. She's an attorney and a social worker. And for purposes of high conflict custody litigation, I think there's a lot of things on her resume, but I think the ones that are most relevant for today is that she has uh, focuses on divorce related mental health. She also has does custody evaluations and parental alienation evaluations. Um, so welcome, Siri. We're glad to have you here to joining us. And you're muted right now, so I'll let you figure that out. Um, Delady can message you to help. You can't hear us. Oh, she can hear me. She can okay. hear us, yeah. I think Delaney can message you to help you get your mute off. So we're going to keep on moving on. 
Um, I should be able to unmute her. Okay, I can do that. Ask, no, it just says to ask to unmute. Okay. Um, okay. Um, you should have three little dots on your screen, um, Siri, that you can use to, or something in the bottom left hand corner to unmute yourself. Um, okay, let's go to the next question while she's looking. Um, sorry, sorry. Oh, can you hear me now? Go. There we go. Yes. I didn't have okay. the link, so I was late joining, and I really apologize. Oh, I lost okay. the screen, but now I'm here. So yeah, we gave me, a great, gave me a great introduction. Nothing we, to add. We, we um, I think in the past two years, all of us have learned to deal with a lot of different technological problems, and sometimes it's just like finding the link <laughs> is one of them. So, exactly. Um, exactly. So, so one of the things I observed, and at least from the cases that I've seen, and, and I would love to have your input, maybe we'll help throw this one at Ryan, about how long it takes to get a decision when it's a high conflict custody case. Um, obviously this is assuming it goes to litigation. Um, my, my observation is that it take, the decisions take a lot longer in, it, in that the trials are spread out a lot longer. Ryan, do you have any feedback on that topic? I mean, that is one of the big points that you really have to prepare your clients for. This isn't like courtroom TV where you get a decision right then and there, and then everybody goes out, they, they walk out the courtroom, they pick up their kid, and they go to Disney World. That's not our reality. First of all, whatever hearing dates you first have set are likely going to be adjourned probably multiple times as you accommodate needs for discovery, issues with witnesses, perhaps do different evaluations. Once you start that trial, I think the best laid plans always go awry once you're in a trial. Technological difficulties, COVID delays, um, we have to be conscious of that now, whether your trial is in person or virtual, witness difficulties, just things down to even weather and whether people can get where they need to go, kids getting sick. Then when you start the trial, even if people think, oh, okay, this will take us two half days, that usually is not the case. You keep going because the court's very busy. Then after that, you're waiting for a decision, which can take months. Then you have to get an order after that decision is entered, which can be difficult. And then you have to prepare your client for the eventuality of potentially an appeal or motions for reconsideration as well. So you can you can be litigating a case on a custody for, for two to three years before you have a final decision. Wow, wow. Um, can we talk for a minute about expert witnesses in these kinds of high conflict cases. Um, are there more experts that are needed in a high conflict case? I mean, I, I do think so. I mean, the first thing is with high conflict cases, high conflict cases have just a special niche. First of all, it shouldn't be us as the attorneys or professionals making it high conflict. Right. It's usually the clients, difficult mm -hmm. mental health issues, substance abuse, CPS investigations, domestic violence, alienation cases. Uh, so when you have those specialized issues, I think of it as the judge needs help or the trier of fact needs help to figure out and decipher those issues. It isn't just a he said, she said. How does this really apply to what is best for the kids? May I jump in from the point of view of a uh, mental health professional? Absolutely. I think part of the problem is because mental health professionals are frequently not brought in until the conflict is so firmly entrenched that it's an mm. uphill battle, if not completely futile guardians ad litem, mental health guardians ad litem, parenting coordinators, um, co-parenting counselors can do a lot to help lessen some of that high conflict before it ever gets to the stage of an actual trial and may even obviate the need for that. So I think it's maybe helpful for lawyers to consider, is there a, a mental health professional in a role that could help these people find some common ground before everything just the wheels fall off. So, so related to that, Siri, do we do we have to have the parties agreeing, hey, yeah, we, we're willing to use a parenting coordinator, or is it one of the parties that's going to do a motion saying, hey, we think uh, a parenting coordinator might be a good idea in this case? Yeah. How does it people, usually people, play yeah. out? Clients don't go online looking for parenting coordinators to help them resolve their conflict. They may not even have ever heard of such a thing. It's usually the lawyers and the lawyers will call me and they will say, we have always enjoyed working together, but this case is going to make enemies of us if we don't get some help. And these people are so toxic and we can't stand our clients and blah, blah, blah. 
So that's all confidential, of course. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, I think everybody in this room, including our, our um, participants and panel, um, has experienced something like that. I'm usually appointed by the court on the motion of one or the other or both attorneys to get a parenting coordinator in there and try to help work with these people um, outside of the court system and see if we can even resolve some issues. And I think some of the hesitancy to bring on a parenting coordinator um, comes from cost. I mm -hmm. mean, in high conflict cases, it's not uncommon that both parties are spending a ton of money on attorney fees. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's our job sometimes as the lawyers, keeping in mind, you know, the best interest of the parties and more importantly, the best interest of their children um, to sometimes explain to them that, you know, when you're talking about 1500 to 2500 per motion, you know, depending on how, how um, extensive it is or the responses mm -hmm. are, um, that can sometimes be avoided altogether um, and addressed in a much faster way by someone like a parenting coordinator. I think a lot of the reason that these cases become so high conflict is because there's a level of frustration there by the parties. Mm -hmm. Somebody did something they probably shouldn't have. Someone did something that was really spiteful. Um, mm -hmm. And there wasn't an expedient way to nip it in the bud or address it or fix it or come up with a probably common sense resolution. Mm -hmm. And so that's when sort of the train flies off the track and the litigation costs skyrocket and you become kind of the revolving door case and the courts start to see you all the time. So I'm not um, sure if your point is that bringing in a parenting coordinator unnecessarily increases the cost to the parties or no she's saying the opposite she's saying okay. the opposite okay it's so like will... it's like an it's like an investment you're you're to right. explain to your client it's an mm -hmm. investment that you pay for the parenting coordinator and then by doing so you're going to save on all those motions that you're going to would otherwise have to fight it out through court because you couldn't use right. this parenting coordinator and to the other, resolve things the, the other practical point is that the parenting coordinator does not supplant the attorneys, but the attorneys do need to be secure enough to take a step back and let the parenting coordinator try to resolve things between the parents um, in a way that recognizes that high conflict people usually have a personality disorder, at least one of them. And as I always say, tens don't marry ones. So you've got people coming in who have particular personality characteristics that incline them to conflict. And um, a parenting coordinator can use those mental health skills to help people see why agreeing on something is in their own best interests. That's how you have to appeal to these folks. They won't do the right thing just because you tell them it's the right thing to do. Right. So, see, yeah. So what I'm saying is, it's one professional whose fee they split. And um, if you have a mental health professional serving as the parenting coordinator, um, they will charge less than attorneys by and large. And it ranges from county to county, but it is cost effective. Um, to the point of this conversation, one of, one of the comments that's been raised in the audience today was um, a reminder of the recent AML conference that we had in May. And there was a topic on managing client expectations at the outset of uh, the case. I'm sorry, I can't remember who did that one, but um, the, the comment was about, you know, clients who have like the scorched earth mentality are not going to want to hear that. But I guess that's where you do one, maybe one attorney has to do the motion and get the judge to make the decision, right? You're not mm -hmm. going to get the two attorneys to agree to do it. You're going to have to do it by motion. Um, I think what's I, what Siri just said uh, was so spot on and to the point of, of um, the person that just commented uh, in the webinar, um, it is in some ways um, a, a technique to sort of play to the personalities of the parties. I have a conflict, high conflict case right now where I tend to believe that my own client is probably 70% of the problem, um, just very strong willed and you know, I've, we have, we have a parenting coordinator in the case and time and again, I've seen that parenting coordinator 
play to my client's desire to be the hero. You know, there's a way for you to, 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 to make this better for your kids, for you to be the person who almost came up with the decision that the parenting coordinator really suggested. Um, but they're really, you know, if you've got the right people in place, I, I think there's a way to sort of um, handle things based upon the personalities. Um, and I, I, and I, oh, just uh, jumping on that just briefly. I mean, sometimes these are things in high conflict cases that we try and sometimes they're just not successful. So there's some ideas of tools in our toolbox. Maybe they try the parenting coordinator for a year. That case, it may just take them out of litigation for a, for a brief period of time. That's kind of something that we see more frequently that we have tried that we they have done the co-parenting counseling, they have done the the other avenues, and now they're at litigation because they may have tried that already. So I have a question for Siri um, about well, actually, I want to jump ahead because we have a question in the chat, but I want to bring up one more topic and then I'll tie in the question on the chat. And this one could be for anybody who wants to answer it about bringing in a GAL or an LGAL. So we were talking about parenting coordinator. Now let's switch it to GAL or LGAL. Um, and at what point do you say to yourself, um, this case really needs to have, I need to have that person you know, here in the case or you know, how does it come about? So I'll just talk about from the point of view of serving both as a parenting coordinator and a GAL. They're different animals, obviously. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, the role of the parenting coordinator is to help the parents reach a resolution, much like, much like a mediator, but with the added component of having a little more clout in terms of making a recommendation, which may, may persuade the court or may not. Um, the GAL is the voice of the child, right? So the GAL is informing the court of her findings as to what is the impact on these children. That's the focus. What's in the best interest of the children? Of course, a parenting coordinator has that in top of mind as well, but the PC is working with the parents and the GAL is presenting information about the various impact of things mm -hmm. to apprise the court of what needs to happen for the kid. So now, I think that's my perspective, but I'd like to from the attorneys. And I think Lisa and Ryan, I think you both of you have served as LJLs at some point, haven't you? I thought so at least. I've, I've been with GAL in a couple of cases, and it's a very different role when you're mm -hmm. the outsider for the child versus being one of the attorneys for a litigant in a, in a high conflict case. Mm -hmm. um, it's it's just a whole different animal, but Siri's right. I mean, that's the voice of the child. Your duty is to the child to make sure that they, you know, you have a voice for them in the context of that litigation. Lise, do you have any comments about like when, when you decide that an LJL or GA would be a benefit to the case? Um, I think as uh, Ryan said, you know, when I'm trying to um, give, I guess, sort of a voice to the child, that's a, a key factor for me. Um, a GAL also, I think can do a few unique things in my opinion. Um, one being, if there's a therapist involved, particularly a therapist mm -hmm. for the child, therapists, understandably, um, when they get a phone call from a lawyer and sometimes from the parents, you know, their spidey senses go up and they're very hesitant to share information um, because understandably their desire is to take care of the mental well-being of the child. And so I think what's unique about a GAL is it seems as though the GAL can in some ways put the therapist at ease and have very meaningful conversations to get a really good idea of what's going on with this child without the therapist feeling that they're going to put the child in a precarious position. So, you know, when I've got a sensitive issue like that, I think bringing on a GAL to be in the child's corner is, is critical. Um, I also think that when it comes to, to working with a GAL, um, sometimes when you need someone to intervene very quickly or to meet with the child um, because something has happened. So mom says, um, you know, little Johnny came home and all of a sudden he's shutting down. He won't take showers. There's, I'm seeing something really weird. Um, and you need, you know, fast intervention to figure out, you know, what exactly is going on. Having a GAL 
in place who can meet with the child um, and talk with them and see how they're doing. Is anything going on at school? How are you feeling? I think that's really important because us as lawyers, we're certainly not going to be meeting with a child at our office. Of course, right. judges, you know, judges are are not really allowed to be meeting with the child to touch base and see how they're doing, uh, other than in the midst of litigation and only to figure out reasonable preference. So there are very few people that can serve in that capacity, and obviously a GAL is one of them. Um, so we have a couple questions in the chat, and one of them uh, was about parenting coordinator, but I actually thought it could also apply um, to the GAL concept. And so the question is, um, where the parties are using a parenting coordinator, um, I think it's the question was using the checks and balance. What checks and balances should be in place to keep a parenting coordinator from making a binding recommendation on a major issue that really should be decided by a judge? Now, I have a personal opinion about like the law um, and, and how that works, like if, if they can make a recommendation and whether it become it goes into effect uh, when it's a parenting coordinator or a GAL. Um, but do you have any thoughts about what checks and balances can be put in place to, to make sure that the judge is deciding that you, these important issues? Right, right. I mean, I yeah, think we're probably all gonna have the same answer. I think that I'm not going to give anybody the authority to make a decision that the judge should make. I was about to ask, are you usually using PCs, like attorney PCs with arbitration power? Because I rarely have cases well, where people are going to- That's agree. the next question that's in the chat series. Somebody wants to know if you could make them like the arbitrators, so you don't have to go to arbitration. You can just use them to make binding decisions. Yeah, which is different. I, I, you know, if you're using them as an arbitration, it's different than just saying, hey, they make a recommendation, which becomes a decision until otherwise- you know, changed right. by the court. Those are two so different I, things. I responded to that question in the chat, but oh, okay. I'll say very briefly that a parenting coordinator who is competent and can write a, an illuminating report for the court has an awful lot of clout. Courts are grateful for someone with insight who can lead them down the path to the conclusion that you want the court to reach in terms of what to order. And you don't need arbitration authority. I think it, you know, that is a very slippery slope and most clients won't go along with it anyway. But I find that my reports to the court are quite persuasive and the judges will most of the time enter them as an order. And I think that's something we have to little, we lawyers sometimes have to be careful of um, because I agree that even a recommendation or just a report with no recommendation, essentially a, like a factual report, it can have, um, a lot of weight in the court. And sometimes that's not good for, for my client. You know, mm -hmm. maybe I've got the problem client. Um, mm -hmm. And so I think as lawyers, you know, we know our cases. Um, we also know the judge assigned to the case pretty well. I mean, the, the counties we choose to practice in are, are usually the counties that we're very familiar with and we're there a lot. We've, we've gotten to know the judges. So I think we have to make a decision very early on when we're bringing on a parenting counselor and decide whether it is going to be helpful or there could be some risk in allowing the parenting coordinator to issue reports or recommendations at all to the court. Um, or is this somebody that we're bringing on to facilitate resolutions between the parties and in the event that the parties you know, come to loggerheads on a particular issue, then they will go down the, the typical path of a motion hearing and the parenting coordinator will not be allowed to um, issue reports or recommendations. The so how does that differ, if I may ask, just, just devil's advocate, from the role of a mediator? If you're not including an evaluative and reporting function for the PC, why not just send them off to mediation? Well, typically, because from a procedural perspective, most of our mediators are scheduling two, three months out. Right. You don't have immediate access to someone who can mm -hmm. um, help facilitate resolution. And, you know, the mediators are not a revolving door. You, you can't just fire off an email to them and say, okay, here's today's problem. Can you help us out? Right. Um, it, it's, you know, obviously they function a little bit differently. Mm -hmm. um, I tend to think so long as I'm working with my client to be doing the right thing. I tend to think that most of the time, I, I would hope the parenting coordinators reports or recommendations are gonna be helpful, um, but it's just not always the case. And I think 
from a strategy perspective, it, it, it really is something you have to think hard about because it could certainly bite your client um, as much as it could help them. Mm -hmm. Right. I mean, the other thing to keep in mind with the parenting coordinator is I believe the statute requires that there be consent of the parties. The court can't order that yes. versus a GAL. Oh, so, you. Correct. you know, I mean, when that first came out and the statute was first developed, people were kind of like, oh, let's just kind of squeeze that in. But the statute's pretty clear on that now that that's something that the parties would need to agree to. Good, good, very excellent point, Ryan. Um, I have a question for um, Siri. Can you talk just for a minute about how is the litigation, this high conflict litigation affecting the children? Yeah, sure. Um, and it's not just the litigation, but just the general, the high conflict in general. Mm -hmm. um, the child can experience a lot of anxiety because of the parents fighting. Uh, the child can get the message from one or both parents that it's just not okay to enjoy your time with the other parent. Um, they learn to either hide a lot of their feelings, like it's not safe to come home and say, hey, mom, I had such a great time with dad. We did this and we did that and know that that's going to be upsetting to mom. And then that child starts to take on a sort of parentified role in protecting the parent from unpleasant reality. And that is, uh, you know, such an unfair burden on the child. So that's, that's just a general quick and dirty overview of some of the risks to children in a high conflict situation. Ryan or Lise, do you have anything to add on that point? Well, I mean, 100%, I mean, we, we all know this, but when you're, you go through a custody trial, it is the worst thing you can ever do for your family. It doesn't often fix, barring there being some certain situations where that writes the ship, perhaps like a legal custody fight or something like that, where decisions need to be made. But for most of most cases, it is, there will be no sitting next to each other at a soccer game. There will be no going, doing a joint first communion party. Um, and these are just things you need to talk about with your client, as well as the financial recovery from the cost of the litigation with very uncertain, unsure results. Um, sometimes this is necessary, right? Sometimes you have to have that legal custody fight. Sometimes you have to have that parenting time dispute, but clients have to be aware of all of those things going into it. Um, you know, and that's our job. So and, I want to switch. Go ahead. Uh, just even the even the cost of parenting coordination, I will often say to clients, do you really want to spend your children's college tuition arguing about this? Really? Yes, they do. <laughs> <laughs> well, sometimes it has some weight, but yeah, you're does. exactly right, Ryan. It's um, these people are really difficult to get through to. Um, so I want to switch gears and talk and have us have a conversation about tips for representing a client in the high conflict litigation, especially custody litigation. And so I would love to hear some tips from our panel. Um, and I, one, one idea I had, and, and I know Lise had a comment that she was gonna share with us, was that what I see a lot on appeal is that it seems to me that, you know, when these cases are dragged out over the course of a year with a trial date spread out, that sometimes the judge basically is making up their mind kind of early in the case. And they're not really necessarily paying attention. Like the, the evidence is not gonna sway. Not that they're not paying attention, but the evidence that comes in in month six or month eight is really not gonna sway them um, because they kind of already know where they wanna go. Um, and so they have they look at everything they hear through these this blinders of where they think the case should be going. And um, I know Lise, you had a suggestion for what you do to help um, frame the case for the judges? Yeah, I, I think um, you get a feel for how your judge feels about the case or about one or both parties um, and headed into an evidentiary hearing or a divorce trial. I really put a ton of time and thought into my opening argument. Um, it's really my plea to the court to essentially say, you know, judge, maybe, maybe it may be something along the lines of, you know, judge, I know you've heard at motion call a number of issues regarding A, B, C, and D, um, but we're asking at this trial that, that you have an open mind as to the evidence that we intend to present, which we believe is going to show, and then really hitting kind of the high notes 
so that the judge starts out with a roadmap in their mind of, well, if that's what I thought of this case, or if that's what I thought of Mr. or Mrs. So-and-so, Lisa's telling me I'm going to hear A, B, C, and D. Mm -hmm. So at least mm -hmm. then they're on the lookout for what you said you're going to show, and then you better show it. <laughs> um, but I think it, it's your first chance of trying to clear the table and say, okay, judge, I'm, I'm asking you to come into this with an open mind. Um, thank you, Lise. And then, you know, I, I, I see a lot of times with these high conflict cases that already came up about how there's a lot of motions, there's a lot of work that goes into them. How, Ryan, do you have any like tips for how do we control the clients like so that we're not filing too many motions? Because I do think that turns off the judges. They're like, are we here again? Do I have to see you guys again? How many motions are you going to file, mom or dad? You know, whoever it is. Um, do you have any tips like for how to control the client so that you don't have to <laughs> file so many motions? I mean, absolutely. I mean, absolutely. I mean, that is always a challenge, especially in some counties like Oakland, where you can get a motion every week. Um, it's a bigger discussion in other counties like Wayne, where you may be waiting two months for a motion date. So maybe you're maybe you're bulking some things, but you don't want to be the person that's continually crying wolf to the judge every Wednesday or every other Friday. Mm -hmm. And then the judge is saying, I, I know I remember you guys and I remember that and maybe they remember the snippet of this one unreasonable position that your client took and then that clouds everything else so uh, always really trying we have to remember we all get really busy as trying to seek concurrence and trying to get some orders resolved um i'm a big proponent that motions in oakland county if any judges here are listening should be set 14 days notice to give people an opportunity to resolve motions before they're actually heard um but i think having those tough discussions with your clients about the pros and cons and ultimately the the uncertainty of that and the expense right so let's save it now a lot of times you're going to go in almost every county that we practice in it's it's referee first then judge or sometimes in washington you see the judge and they refer you to the referee another day so you could be having multiple hearings and multiple conferences on on an issue that maybe you guys could have resolved or bulk them together so you've got a lot at once so um, I wanted to talk a little bit about, about getting assessments that might help the case. And I know, Siri, I think you can help us understand a little bit of the different kinds of assessments, um, like a, what's the difference between a parental alienation assessment versus a custody evaluation versus mm -hmm. a psychological evaluation, just to kind of lay the, the framework for everybody so that our audience kind of understands like how they should be using these assessments. Yeah, sure. Okay, so very briefly, um, an attorney... Um, trying to determine whether and what kind of evaluation may be called for in a case is going to need to identify what the questions are that you want an opinion, an expert opinion on, um, because they're all different animals. A psychological evaluation is searching for the presence of mental illness. It is not designed to assess for quality of parenting. It can just tell you about the person's personality, uh, mental health concerns that may crop up uh, and they make use of psychological testing to arrive at that conclusion. But the conclusion you're going to get from a psychological evaluation is, I tested this person and this person presents as someone who likely blah, 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 blah. They're not going to tell you about what kind of parent this is. Whereas a custody evaluation um, if conducted by like a social worker like me, I'm not licensed to conduct psychological testing. And for purposes of a custody evaluation, I don't feel that they really add any value. A custody evaluator is going to meet with everybody who has anything relevant to say, both the parents several times, the children if appropriate, collateral sources like relatives, friends, teachers, pediatrician, um, and really get to know this family and the dynamic between them. And when I write a custody evaluation, I am quoting the parents word for word, what they said, what concerns that raises for me. I'm identifying patterns of behavior that I think will give you a good sense of what kind of parent are they? Do they have the capacity to even recognize that their children have needs different from their own? And then to honor that and make some personal sacrifices in the interest of their children. 
that's what a custody evaluation can provide. It's very thorough, it's very personalized, and it focuses on the fitness of the parents. So I know you're going to mention parental and alienation assessments, but before you leave custody evaluations, I have a question for you. So sure. I've, I've, I've read quite a, quite a few of them over the years, and a lot of them, you know, they'll contain a best interest analysis. Is the approach of a custody evaluator doing the best interest um, analysis yeah, different I mean, than I'm, how a judge would go about it? Um, I was about, to, I was going to address that after I talked about oh, okay. <laughs> parent, parental child alienation evaluation. Yeah. The short answer is yes, but I'd like to expand on it. Okay, more. excellent. Uh, an alienation evaluation is just that. Is alienation happening? It's a pretty serious charge, and I don't throw that term about lightly. In fact, I shy away from labeling anything. Um, I focus more on what behaviors are we seeing, what history, what patterns, what can we reasonably assume will continue into the future. Um, an alienation evaluation, I mean, there are lots of ways for kids to reject parents, right? And it's on a continuum um, or even not rejecting, but having a stronger bond with one parent over the other, that's normal in early childhood. Farther along the spectrum is an estrangement from a parent, reasonable rejection because the parent's a jerk or is abusive, all the way to the extreme, which is real alienation where a kid says, I don't want to have anything to do with you ever again in my whole life. I can't tell you specifically why, I'm just not comfortable, okay? And that can get entrenched very quickly. Mm -hmm. When I write these various evaluations, and I, I don't do psych evals, just custody and alienation evals, I do follow the best interest factors. After I have presented sort of like my case in chief, who are these people? What do we see them doing? What's the dynamic? Then I then toward the end, I go through the assessment just as if like I were the friend of the court and looking at all the factors. And I, I present the evidence that I have found to support whatever my conclusion is as to the factors. I think it's critical. The judge needs a roadmap and the best interest factors tick all the boxes. Is that what you were asking? Yeah, no, it is. Thank you. Thank okay. you. Um, Ryan or Lise, do you have any uh comments or feedback on the assessment issue? I have a question and because Siri is such a wealth of knowledge, um, is there a difference or should we ever be asking for a psychiatric versus a psychological evaluation depending on, um, you know, if we think the issue is uh, OCD um, and hoarding, or if we think the issue is whatever, I mean, is there a difference? Should we be asking for psychiatrists to do an assessment versus a psychologist? And does it, I mean, are we going to get to the same place or do we need probably about medication? Yeah. Or? I mean, you know, a psychologist is competent to administer the tests and to discern if, if there's a character disorder. Okay. Um, and likewise, if there's patent mental illness, I mean, a social worker can tell you too. A psychiatrist is more focused on the, the treatment. What are we going to do with this person's mental illness? You know, medication, um, combination of medication and psychotherapy. Um, they may delve deep. If you had someone who has been diagnosed bipolar, for example, you might want to send them for an updated psychiatric evaluation when you know that you're dealing with a specific mental illness. Um, if it's a serious case, if you think the parent is really out of touch with reality and is um, a, a threat to the well-being of the child, you may want to go with a psychiatric evaluation. That's pretty serious. Um, I don't want to go on if that addressed your question. That, that really did. I appreciate it. If you want, I think my bottom line is, if you want to know how do these folks parent, what is it like to be their child? Then you want to go for a custody evaluation because that you're going to get the nuts and bolts of that. Now, do these evaluations, I knew the answer pre-March 2020, but are these evaluations happening in person? Like, are you meeting with the, the family members in person? I, or is I used to, but during COVID, I just started doing it on Zoom virtually. And I have not found any decrease in the quality of, of my work. And I think a lot of people clients are even more comfortable because these things are anxiety producing for clients. And, you know, you have to recognize and honor the fact that 
their anxiety may may cause them to appear less functional than than they really are. Mm -hmm. And when they're in the comfort of their own home, I think that relieves some of that anxiety. So I, you know, I have no geographical limitations because now I'm doing everything versus Zoom and I like it so much I'm not going back. It's so convenient and it's so much easier and it's more efficient and it's less costly and people don't have to get in the car and drive. And I, I just think the 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 results are quite, I, I don't see any um, hmm. diminution in the effectiveness. Yeah, I mean, awesome. I feel a little bit differently on that. I think that there's a, I feel there's a benefit to having, to observing people in person sometimes. I think I'm seeing that people are sometimes doing a combination. Maybe they do a first meeting. I even do this, I'm a GA on a case right now. I did my first meeting with the, with the child on Zoom. Then in two weeks, she came into my office. Then we went back to Zoom. So that way I could kind of get a sense. There is a concern. We've all seen those clips about who else is in the room or what else is going on. So we have to be more cognizant, I think, of people's fears and concerns and health concerns and scheduling, just like we were talking about with the trials. Um, but it's interesting. I think that will be an interesting turnabout as well as how people present on camera versus in person. I mean, that is a that is a whole thing. You have clients, you might look at somebody on Zoom and you're thinking they look crazy as all get out, right? <laughs> that is very but if true. they were sitting next to you at the council table, they may present as calm and put together. I mean, there are so many different dynamics that we didn't have to think about before because it wasn't it wasn't an option. Yeah, that's a really excellent point, Ryan. So one um, follow up question in the chat before we move on to the next topic. Um, Siri is being asked about testing. Do you do the testing via Zoom as well? How does that work? I don't do testing. I'm a social worker. I'm not so licensed. Oh, because you're not doing the psychological evaluation. Yeah. Right. 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 Okay. Yeah. Got it. Got it. Got it. Okay. And I, don't I think know. most of those that are doing psychological are doing them in person. I, I, I think they all are. I would strongly encourage that because just like Ryan says, people do you can pick up on some things in person that you, you may not pick up on over Zoom quite as soon. If you work with these people over time, uh, I find that I do pick up on stuff that I might've gotten a little sooner if we were meeting in person. Mm -hmm. That's true. So Lise, do you have any tips to help manage client expectations as we're going through this whole like lengthy custody litigation? So um, there's kind of, I guess, what I would call my, my three big um, considerations when I'm preparing my clients for litigation, for, for a hearing of some sort or a trial. Um, I think, you know, I, Ryan already talked about the expectations of, of what happens and how it works and how long it takes. Um, but in terms of my preparing a client, um, I... I will tell you, I probably spend three times as much time with them than they will ever spend on the stand, getting them ready to be on the stand. Um, my, you know, my methodology, uh, I usually walk them through what I am fairly confident are going to be the really tough questions, because if they're going to give a horrific answer, I'd rather them give it to me first. Um, so we can talk about it and figure out, uh, you know, how how to really, you know, tweak it and, and adjust it. Um, I also think them having to answer those tough questions with me takes away the shock of it when they get hit with it on the stand. Um, and, you know, it helps remove a little bit of sometimes the, the not so great emotion, the, you know, the knee jerk reaction or the snarky mm -hmm. remark or the anger, because we've already done this once. They knew it was coming. Um, and, and, you know, we had an opportunity to address it. Number two, um, I tell clients all the time that what they say is important, but even more important sometimes is their tone, their demeanor, um, especially now that a lot of the judges, even if they're not do, right, even if they're not doing in-person for motion calls, a lot of the courts are returning to in-person for trials and hearings. Um, and even if you are on Zoom, um, your, your credibility is incredibly important in the hearing. Um, even things like may, maybe you're appearing fine, you, you seem credible, uh, you seem nice, um, but sometimes I have clients that look like they're just not even paying attention. And I'm thinking, 
what is the judge going to think if this is the most critical thing in your whole life and you look like you have other stuff to do today? Um, so tone and demeanor are so incredibly important, even sometimes at the council table. You know, do yeah. not roll your eyes. Do not huff and puff. Um, you know, don't, you know, at all times, we're all paying attention to what you're doing. Um, and then number three, you know, the, the be all end all question for my clients is what do you want? I need to hear, you know, if this is a parenting time trial, what give me your golden answer? And I want to hear it verbatim, you know, because judges all the time cringe. I want 50, 50. Well, children are not ratios. Um, you know, this is not a pie chart. I want to know what does that look like? Did you give this thought? Um, you know, I want a two, two, five. Well, that's a great catchphrase. And yes, we all know what that means, but have you thought about, and, and you want to let the judge know, you know what, my son has soccer on Mondays and that's something I've always coached. So I'd really like to have Monday, Tuesday so I can do it with him. Or maybe you say, you know what, I'd really like to have Wednesday, Thursday, because I'm also then going to be able to see him on Monday. So I'll get to see him actually a little bit more, even though it's mom's time. Give me something meaningful and let the judge know that you really put thought into this because this is your child. Mm -hmm. um, so the what do you want question is something I hammer home. Um, holidays, everything. Really think about this. Uh, so those are kind of my three big ones. And of course, you know, we do a ton of prep work with our clients and we all have our little rules and things that we talk to them about. But those I think are really key for me. Great. Thank you. Brian, do you have anything to add? I mean, those are all great tips. I think I, you know, structure my prep probably similar to how this does. We just spend a lot of time also thinking about who are we calling? When are we calling them? What does that look like? It's harder if you're a defendant or the non-moving party. Um, that can be a challenge in how you, how you structure those witnesses. Um, but a lot of, a lot of prep time. So could you give us some advice, Brian, on instructing the client and how they interact with um, the opposing party or with the court? Any tips that we should be like helping our clients understand how they should, I guess, behave in those contexts? In, in court or outside of court? Both. <laughs> I mean, right. Oh. I mean, they have to remember that when they're in this type of ongoing custody, everything you say, text, email, mention to your neighbor, say to your mother, mother-in-law, it will be used. I mean, a lot of custody trials. Yeah. Right. A lot. Of, yeah. A lot of custody trials turn on small things. It's not always the case that is about abuse or domestic violence. We don't always have those red herrings. Maybe it's a pattern of not responding to the Our Family Wizard communication so decisions can't be made. Maybe it's making a comment you know, to the teacher at school that then gets back to the other parent and doing that then to the pediatrician. So everything you are doing is under a microscope. So be able to explain it, be able to stand by it and don't make me mad. <laughs> Siri, I, I wanted to see if you could add specifically about parents dealing with each other, even while the litigation is going on. Do you have any thoughts that you can share with us on that? And while the litigation, you mean during trial? No, like outside or, of the courtroom. You know, they have parenting time exchanges, even though there's a trial, right? You know, we, we have some sort of parenting time in place and they're having to interact with each other, even though they're in the middle of this high conflict litigation. I'm trying to think if I've actually been involved in a case that that went to trial and that I was still the PC. Still there. I mean, usually PCs are appointed um, post-judgment, not necessarily, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but um, I think, you know, I, with my clients, whether they're approaching litigation or there's a motion or something, um, I try to establish protocols of behavior with them. Right. Okay. That are extremely clear, um, maybe formulaic, but there are a lot of, I, you all know this. You assume that people know and understand basic stuff, and they don't. Right. They don't, right? <laughs> so it may be that, you know, the exchange protocol is 
you park out the street. You do not go into the driveway. You remain in your car. Say your goodbyes at home before you get the kid in the car so that the exchange is quick, brief. I mean, really nitty gritty behavioral um, instructions. Do you have like, you mentioned protocols. Do you have ones that you've used over and over again that you kind of just, okay, this case, I'm going to need these three protocols and I'm going to make sure that these parents have the, these tools yeah. to avoid yeah. conflict. So, yeah. Excellent. I mean, I, I try not to present them as if I'm a robot or, you know, wrote, <laughs> but I am explaining to them, here's how we're going to do it. This is how, this is how phone calls are going to go. You know, you have to respond within 24 hours. And if you don't know the answer, you still have to respond. I don't know the answer, but I will find out and I will get back to you by Thursday. You know, and that can, that can take care of a lot of the little, um, things that fuel the flames, fuel the fire. Great. Yeah, I mean, they're basic. I mean, this is what I'm talking about. They're, they're basic common sense that these people just can't employ. Right. right. Or, you know, I mean, emotions are so high. They're so heightened. They make, they, a lot of times we, you know, it's like people say criminal clients are like the worst people on their best behavior, right? Like they're, they listen to everything their attorneys say in family law world. They so often don't because they're so, I mean, think about any other practice of law that touches on your kids, your money, your future, your finances, your friends, your family connections, where you live. Um, so it's kind of our job and hopefully with the help of a mental health professional to write that ship the best, the best we can. So do um, Ryan and Lisa, especially, do you have any tips for organizing how you're going to do a presentation at trial just to keep, you know, to keep the judge engaged, to keep the case flowing when it's, we know it's a high complicated case, it's going to take longer and, and involve more time. Um, I guess I look at it at two, from two possible perspectives, um, and it depends really on the case issues. I either try to dissect it based upon the strongest factors, and I decide whether or not I want those to be kind of more at the beginning or more at the end, depending on, you know, getting my judge's attention or leaving the greatest impact as we wrap up. Um, and if I'm not focusing on the strongest factors, I guess I sometimes look at it more from, um, do I focus on the positives or am I focusing on the negatives? And I hate to kind of say it that way, but sometimes the most important issue is a, something very negative. Maybe it's a domestic violence case or maybe um, it's a child abuse case. And so I'm gonna spend a lot of time creating a significant impact for the court focusing on the negatives. Uh, or maybe my opposing party does awful terrible things, you know, just a, a all around D minus parent. And I, I, you know, my, my case in chief may be spent, you know, in large part focusing on the, the really terrible parent. Sometimes though, like Ryan said, there's cases where there's not this amazing smoking gun. There's no big red herring. And so sometimes in those cases, um, you know, I know Mark Bank at our last AAML um, seminar had talked about, you know, wouldn't it be nice if sometimes in our hearings, you said almost nothing negative, you spent your case in chief building up your client, so that at the end of your case in chief, the judge can sit there and say, you know what, if I give dad the parenting time he's asking for, this kid's going to be a okay, you know, so sometimes my case is more my, my client's amazing. Let me tell you about all of these things he does uh, or she does um, and all the little nitty gritty and what they know about their child and how they click and all the special things they do. Um, and so sometimes, like I said, my case is, I guess, more positive and sometimes mm -hmm. it's more negative. It really just depends on the facts. Mm -hmm. I, I completely agree. And that's a struggle you go through as you're preparing your trial, your position when you might write your brief or even organizing exhibits. It may change on the day, even of the trial. What have you had mentioned to me previously about like thinking about the order of the witnesses? Mm -hmm. I, I'm sorry, I don't remember who, who it was. <laughs> could, could either one of you address that topic? <laughs> I mean, that's what I struggle with a lot. Are we calling the adverse party right away? Are we getting them on the stand? Or are we roasting them right away? Because I think we all know, like all of us, 
what people are hearing, what our judges or our referees are hearing right away. And then at the end, I think stick out the most, except for those moments when the judge is like, oh, did that really happen? You know, like it's coming out in the testimony. So you really have to think about that order of presentation and what's going to work best for your case. And I think that kind of touches as well as when Lise was saying, like, do I want all the good stuff or not? Do you do you think that you know when you're give all these considerations about how to do the presentation of the trial, is it are you thinking about the judge and the judge's personality more, or is it more about depends on the issues and the and the parties? I I really look at it from who is going to be the most impactful witness. So nine times out of ten, my client wants to trail in everyone and their uncle. Um, you know, because look, I, this is their opportunity to be heard. It's very mm -hmm. unique. It's very different than motion call mm -hmm. where mm -hmm. they didn't get to say a word. It was only me talking and maybe I only got five minutes. Um, so this is really their day in court that they've been waiting for for a very long time. And, you know, that's part of the prep and part of um, managing expectations of the client. Yes, you can call your five sisters and your mom, but they're probably all going to say the same thing. And there is a piece of that that goes to credibility. If you call my mom, she's going to tell you I'm the most amazing person. I hope she's going to tell you I'm the most amazing person <laughs> in the world. Um, and so you really have to explain to clients what the goal of testimony is when you're picking who you're going to call and why, because the courts are very busy and you can very, very easily lose the judge can lose interest because you're just taking not very impactful not very purposeful or repetitive testimony mm -hmm. um, so you've got to be super purposeful yep yeah, the repetitive testimony is, is spot on. I mean, we got to remember our judges are active listeners. And I tell clients this as well, right? They are used to multitasking. They are, they are at the peak there. They can sign an order. They're checking a PPO. They're conversing with their staff. They're listening. They're taking notes. I mean, they're very good active listeners. So you, and also we don't have to hammer everything home with them. They hear testimony all the time. Like, you keep pounding that hammer and the judge is like, I get, like, I'm not stupid, you know? <laughs> so I, I try to be cognizant of that. We all get carried away one time. Sometimes you're like, and you ask that again. And you're like, oh, I did that again. But we really have to remember these are, most of our judges are at the peak of their practice, their career, their preparation. They've read it. I find that most of our family law judges are prepared now. I, I, they read everything. They confer with their staff. They have us in for settlement conferences. They know the facts. This is, I would say that family law practice, even in the 15 years, I find that our judges are supremely more prepared than they were when I first started practicing. And, and one so, other tiny thing, if there is just a volume of information that you want to convey, just keep in mind that you've got that 20 page brief that you could submit should be submitting in advance so you know it, it it's not as if the only thing they've ever heard about this whole case is going to be what you put you know in testimony you've already had an opportunity to kind of lay it out sometimes in a better more organized fashion in your brief um so use that as a tool you know obviously mm -hmm. as part of your litigation Excellent. So we're out of time. If anybody has any closing thoughts they want to share, I don't want to cut anybody off, um, but I do like to honor our time constraints. Um, any last comments? Go I think one, we could all keep going for a while. <laughs> I know we could. Yeah. But I want to thank all three of you so much for being here. This has been a wonderful conversation. I think it's, I'm hoping it's given a lot of great ideas to our family law trial attorneys out there. So thank you again. And I would look forward to seeing you in the fall. Yes. The summer. <laughs> All right. All right. Thank you, Lisa. Bye -bye. Thank you. Thank you.